It's the Wigan Sessions, a show where key thinkers and industry pioneers discuss politics, economics, philosophy, and history. Big ideas impacting the economy, the financial markets, and our lives. Here's your host, Addison Wigan. Welcome to the Wigan Sessions. I'm your host, Addison Wigan. This week, I'm back with my good friend and one of the smartest people I know, Jim Rickards. For most of you, Jim needs no introduction, but if you don't know, he's the editor of Strategic Intelligence, Tactical Currency Profits, and Crash Speculator. He's an American lawyer, economist, and investment banker with 40 years of experience working in capital markets on Wall Street, and the author of multiple National and New York Times bestselling books on money and global finance. In this session, we jammed about Jim's origin story, why he sees the world the way he does, the Davos crowd and their agenda in 2022, Jim's forecast for the Fed's next moves in 2022, the progressives and globalists lust for control, Fed coin versus crypto, then Jim recommends real diversification, not faux diversification. Listen in to discover what he means by real. Are you ready? Let's jam. Hello, welcome to the Wigan Sessions. I'm your host, Addison Wigan. I have with me today, Jim Rickards, who I'm sure you're familiar with. But what I'd like to do to start today's episode or session, as we call it, uh, is have Jim talk about his own experience and give us a clue into why he views the world the way that he does. Because I think you'll find it particularly interesting given the um, the economic times that we're in. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Madison. Great to be with you. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I learn something new every time. <laughs> so if you can, um, I know this the story, but if you could just kind of like bring people up to speed on like your experience in life, uh, Start in New Jersey in in the nineties, right? Well, if you like, I can start in New Jersey in the nineties. I can start in New Jersey in the nineteen fifties, but uh, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to try to narrow it down a little bit. I take a hundred hours. I'll try to do it in ten minutes. Yeah, I mean, background. I went to high school. I graduated from Cape May High School. Uh, when I was there, it's still eh, largely true, but certainly when I was growing up there, I went to high school there. It was mostly rural and fishing. Those were the two occupations. We had, you know, the run of things you could do, but most people either were farmers or fishermen. Those were the two main things. Now, Cape May is a major tourist destination. So you had, it was a summer Cape May and a winter Cape May. The population actually increased by a factor of five. It went from like 10,000 year round population to 50,000 in the summer. And a lot of wealthy families from, uh, uh, Philadelphia and Baltimore, you know, the rich New Yorkers tend to go to the Hamptons or, you know, people go to Newport, but for certainly wealthy families in Philadelphia and Baltimore, Cape May was destination. Uh, it was in, in the 1880s. Uh, it was known as the Summer White House. A uh, number of presidents stayed at Congress Hall, which was built in 1813. It's still there, by the way. I stayed there not too long ago. So, uh, interesting place. So yeah, we had, we never had any problem getting summer jobs because there was, uh, like I say, there was a, always a call for help. But it was, I said, the other nine months of the year, it was, it was rural, uh, fairly poor. We didn't feel poor. We, we were. I mean, if you did a demographic analysis, I guess we fit in that maybe lower middle class society, certainly not middle class or certainly not upper middle class, but we didn't feel that way. We had a good time. We played sports. Uh, we worked on our studies and so forth. But my high school class, for example, was, uh, 40% college bound, 60%. That was it. So for 60% of my class, my friends, I was class president. So it was pretty good, pretty well acquainted with everybody. Um, that was it. That was the only time they were ever going to wear a cap and gown. It was the only time they were ever going to be handed a diploma. It was a very big deal. Our high school graduation, but well, I was, uh, did pretty well academically, went to Johns Hopkins University. So that was my introduction to Baltimore. Got a graduate degree there. So I ended up living in Baltimore for five years. Been back many times since. I still go back for a lot of reasons, but, um, yeah, I, I, should, 
<laughs> yeah, sure for I lo- love Baltimore. I uh, always enjoy going back, and I was actually lived lived there for for uh, for five years. Then um, got a graduate degree, a master's degree in international economics. But it was sort of the worst recession since the Great Depression. This is like 1974. You know, the younger people in the audience don't remember what it was like in the 70s, but that was a, a really severe market crash. Uh, I was getting an early education in market volatility. Uh, and there weren't too many jobs around. So I said, well, I'll keep going to school. I went to law school, went up to the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And then when I graduated, you know, when I got my law degree, I started working in New York as an international tax counsel at Citibank. But I went nights to NYU and I got a, a, a graduate law degree in taxation. My father did ask me at one point when I was going to stop going to school. But I, um, by, by, by the time I was 30, I finished. Yeah. Finished you, up. you might uh, turn that around on my kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I, I but I was, I was banging out the degrees. I got four degrees. Uh, but it was International Tax Council, Citibank. And then that was a portal or gateway, whatever you want to call it, to the world. I mean, Citibank. One of the reasons I joined them as opposed to a law firm, they were in business in 98 countries at the time. This was in 1976. So uh, they had more overseas offices or, than the State Department had embassies. So if you really want to see the world, uh, you could join the Foreign Service, you could work for Citibank, and I did. And uh, they just you know, traveled many circuits around the world, uh, started out in Europe, but uh, moved to uh, Asia Pacific and Africa. And I was the number two guy coming up the ranks. So my boss would go to, uh, you know, Tokyo, Sydney and Singapore. And I would get like, uh, you know, Zimbabwe, uh, Kinshasa and, uh, Nairobi. Nairobi was fun, but, um, yeah, I traveled quite a bit in Africa. So it was, but that was an interesting time. It was a commodities boom. It was actually in in the aftermath of a commodities boom. So you could see, you know, when, when cocoa and copper and oil prices have been soaring in the seventies, which they were, there's all this money coming in and then it crashed in the eighties. So the early eighties was the time I was out there. So you could see the aftermath, how the money was wasted. There was corruption. They built a skyscraper and then they couldn't maintain it. So when I got there, like the windows were falling out, they would say, look at this big skyscraper. So but it was, it was a, a really good education in development economics, a subject people don't know all that much about. In the mid eighties, I changed it up. I left. After 10 years as international tax counsel, I joined an investment bank uh, that was one of the top dealers in U.S. government securities. So we were what's called a primary dealer. If you like, what's a primary dealer? Well, that's a list uh, maintained by the Fed. And it basically is a your permission to trade directly with the Fed. So when the Fed prints money, I can't let you print money. You know, of course, it's all digital. But the way they do it, they buy bonds from banks. And they pay for it with money that comes out of thin air. I mean, it's, it's that simple. It's not more complicated yeah. than that. So yeah. the Fed builds up a balance sheet of bonds and the money comes out of thin air. Well, the Fed needs dealers. They need people they can call to do those trades. And they're very, very selective. And they're only today, it's about 20. The list varies. But my firm was one of the firms on that list. So we talked to the Fed. We were, we were one of the few that could. So that was an immersion in um, federal finance, fiscal policy, U.S. government securities market. But this is the mid to late 80s. But that was the time when the derivatives market was taking off. Of course, you know, traditional futures contracts have been traded in Chicago since the 1850s. But this was um, these are swaps, options, swaptions, caps and floors all over the counter, all off the balance sheet. All yes, you know, we 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 invented. Uh, this private team, we invented some of the contracts. I, I worked on the first credit default swap, sovereign credit default swap ever. We didn't have any forms. There were no membership organizations. We had to sit there and, and basically write the contract, which I did with, uh, uh, with some teammates who did the, uh, did the math. So it was a pretty exciting time. In the mid nineties, I changed it up again. You begin to get the idea that I either didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up or I was, I, you know, I preferred the word eclectic in terms of a career, but, uh, I changed up again and joined a hedge fund. I was there for six years from start to finish in the late 90s. We made a few headlines in 1998. Uh, this was long-term capital management. Uh, and prior to the financial crisis of 2008, you know, the mortgage meltdown and Lehman Brothers and all that, the LTCM fiasco was the greatest financial panic in the United States since the panic of 1907. Uh, it's not that there hadn't been, you know, stock market crashes and the Great Depression was stressful and uh, Penn Square and Continental Illinois, a couple of big banks failures in the 80s. 
We had the SNL crisis uh, that just dragged on through the 1980s. So it's not that there was no financial distress, but in terms of a panic that actually did come this close to taking down the entire global financial system, that was it. And I negotiated that rescue and lined up against, four, the, I call them the 14 families, but the 14 banks. Uh, the original deal was uh, 16 banks were going to put in um, uh, $250 million each, and that was going to be $4 billion, and that was the, the rescue amount. But Bear Stearns dropped out, and uh, they got their... <laughs> They got their payback in 2008. No one shed any tears when Bear Stearns failed in March 2008. But the, but Wall Street has long memories, and they remember Bear Stearns turning their back on the rest of the street in '98. So when Bear Stearns was in distress in 2008. Again, no no tears were shed. And that was a, their sort of a payback from Wall Street. Uh, the other one was Lehman Brothers, which just didn't have the money. So they they scaled down to 100 million. Goldman, J.P. Morgan, a couple others scaled up from 250 to 400 to make up the difference. And we cobbled together 4 billion, all cash, five days. Uh, it was five days in the September 98, no sleep. Uh, you know, this funny, the first day you're at the law firm, hundreds of lawyers running around in different rooms. There was a tax room, a bankruptcy room, a, a foreign syndicated unsecured credit room, you know, due diligence room, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, first day everyone's got a suit and tie on. Next day, you know, the ties are down, the collars are open. The day after that, the ties are gone, the jackets are gone, the shirts are half open, no one's sleeping, no one's bathing, we're just working around the clock, but we got it done. But we were hours away from shutting every market in the world. That's not an exaggeration. It would have started in Tokyo and just yeah. going around the world. They would have reopened at some point, but it was a, we're looking at a global sh- uh, shutdown. Uh, from there, worked at um, a couple of technology companies, ran a stock exchange, did a few other things, but after 2001, after 9-11, I got tapped by the, um, by the uh, CIA, the intelligence community, to work on counterterrorism finance, which I did for quite a long time. And that was, needless to say, interesting. Uh, some things I can say about that and some things I can't. But it was uh, certainly uh, taking a lot of practical experience, going back to uh, they were actually interested in me because I had converted uh, Citibank Pakistan to Islamic banking in the early 80s. So I was actually one of the leading Western experts on Islamic banking. And of course, that was a big part of counterterrorism finance. Uh, but, you know, did quite a few things there. Uh, and then, uh, did, uh, you know, a few other, a few other things. But by that point, I was sort of regular on CNBC doing it and ultimately ended up doing, you know, Bloomberg, Fox News, a lot of other financial networks. But I also started writing books and my first book, Currency Wars and came out in 2011 was a national bestseller. Um, then followed up after that with the death of money, which was, uh, a New York Times bestseller. Not easy to make that list. And I've been writing books ever since. And around that time, 2014, bumped into you and some of your colleagues and started working with, uh, Agora and different imprints and so forth. And then had a long, uh, long career at this point in, uh, international newsletters. So like I said, a little bit of everything, but if you ask me to stitch it all together, I would say law, finance, intelligence, national security, economics, those are all areas where I feel pretty comfortable. But of course, you learn some lessons along the way. And uh, I had gone, uh, not me, but my family had gone through a, a bankruptcy situation in the early 60s. This is 1962. And at that time, the bankruptcy laws were a lot more stringent than they are today. Today, it's, yeah, you do some court filings, there's some procedure, but you kind of walk away without a scratch and start over. But then, I mean, in those days, they took the house, they took the car, um, they put a lien on your salary. So even if you had a job and you were making money, uh, a lot of it was taken right off the top to pay creditors. It was kind of no easy way out. So that was, I was a, you know, like a 12 year old kid at the time, but you know, 12 year olds are, you know, they're going through their own changes. And so all of a sudden to go from a, you know, brand new, uh, Chevrolet convertible to a 10 year old Chrysler, uh, Imperial or, you know, also Bill F98 with the, with the seat through the floor to the road, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, not getting new clothes all the time, uh, living in a bungalow, $35 a month. I look back on it and, uh, but I said this for a long time, but I'll say it again. It was the, the best thing that ever happened to me. Highly stressful for my family. Not fun. I'm not, I'm not making light of it, but, um, it teaches you how to rebuild. It teaches you how to reinvent yourself. Uh, it was at that point uh, that when we moved, I didn't have any friends because I, you know, lived in one 
community for at that point, like you say, 10, 11 years and uh, had a a whole network of friends. All of a sudden that's pulled away from you and you go into a new, I was in seventh grade, but we actually, we were so poor, but the the town was so poor. We had a six year high school. So we were, we were on the bus with the seniors as we were seventh graders. Uh, You know, they were on the back of the bus. I don't know what was going on back there, but I, as a seventh grader, you sit in front of the bus. You learned a lot. So I became very focused on studies and got good grades. It's kind of how I got into college. My closet was a nail on the wall. You hammered a nail on the wall and you hung your hoodie on it. And that was, you know, your jeans or whatever. And that was it. It gives you resilience. I mean, I've never worried about money ever since. Uh, I've made a lot of money, but I always, if you've ever lived through anything like that, you're like, you know what? If it all went away, I could, I could survive just fine. And that's a great source of strength. It gives you strength for all the other things you have to do and all the other challenges you face. Because if you've never had a bad day or you've never had uh uh what we think is called you know the the wheel of fortune, the reversal of fortune. Actually I know people who who you know been very successful, made a ton of money, you know, and, and various accomplishments to say that's all good. But they've literally never had a bad day. And and a lot of them are very insecure. They're like because they they worry about that. They're like, oh well. What would happen if uh, yeah. uh, if this went away? And and having been through that, I know that you do just fine. You just have to kind of keep focused. Same thing happened in 1998 during the long-term capital situation. You know, I was their lawyer. I worked there. I was there from start to finish, but I also had quite a bit of money invested in the firm. I was the lawyer. I was like, wow, I'm working with all these geniuses, and they were they were they did have genius like you, and they were two Nobel Prize winners. Um, I'm like, well, I'll just, you know, give them my money that they know more about than I do and they'll do fine. Uh, and for four years we did. I mean, we kind of tripled our money and then it went down, you know, 92%. Wasn't bankrupt, wasn't kicked out of my house, but that was a real, uh, setback. And, uh, once again, you just pick yourself up and you go from there. So, uh, so I've had a couple of those reversals and, uh, they actually make you stronger. I was working uh, with a hedge fund in the early 2000s and, with my partner, we went to um, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, we're meeting with one of the big hedge fund allocator, asset allocators, uh, further further out on uh, on the lake, kind of like a suburb. But anyway, I ended up downtown at this dinner and we're having a couple of glasses of wine. And they agreed to give us $50 million, a $50 million allocation to this fund. And the guy leaned over to me, uh, the, guy, the decision maker, and said, you know, he said, I know what happened at long-term capital. He said, I wouldn't give money to anyone who's never had a setback because you know what it's like. You won't let it happen again. And I have more confidence in people like that than I do people who have never had a bad day because that means they they can be a little arrogant and they can miss things. So I thought that I, I mean, I agree with that, but of course that's just like agreeing with myself, but, but he, he made a point of telling me that and I thought it was very interesting, but it certainly lined up with my experience once you've been through something like that you don't let it happen again so uh so yeah a little bit of law finance banking hedge funds intelligence national security economics writer yeah. so let's writer, let's move it along um, part of the reason i want to talk to you today is the davos agenda was just announced last week they got together in davos as they do and uh you have a unique perspective on not not just what they say but also the people who are involved in that entire endeavor. And there's a lot of unelected people who are making decisions about what the way that the economy will, not just the national economy, but the global economy will unfold from here. And they have ideas about the way that they want to uh, impose policy, I guess is probably the best way to say it. So that's part of the reason I wanted to, to get your experience on the table before you start talking about the Davos set is what I call them. Yep. <laughs> they kind of annoy me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a Davos set. I call them the global elites. You know, I make the point that a lot of people who talk about them, write about them, the Great Reset, you know, they're different names. But I think the Great Reset is the one that's got the most currency at the moment. They're smart people and they pay attention and they can come up with some good analysis, but there's several steps removed. They don't actually get invited to those things. They, they've never met the individuals involved. And to a great extent, I have. I mean, I've, I've met with uh, you know, just like one-on-one conversations, not like waving in front of the audience, but, you know, this is a one-on-one conversations uh, at length with Ben Bernanke, uh, uh, Tim Geithner, the former head of the uh, IMF, uh, uh, John Lipsky, and uh, I, I once gave a private briefing, closed doors, 
behind closed doors in, in Rockefeller Center, where else, right? <laughs> to the head of Bilderberg. And if there's one group that's even more spooky and, you know, secretive than Davos, it's, it's Bilderberg. Cause I mean, Davos, you can, you can kind of buy your way in, but, uh, Bilderberg is invitation only. It's a much smaller group, but I, I briefed the head of it and he was very nice, nice guy. And he, uh, at the end of it, he, he came over and presented me a gift and I opened it. It was a, uh, it was a vase, um, with like kind of a swirling glass, but kind of you know, beautiful. Uh, it's, in fact, it's right over here. It's on the, on the shelf near my uh, desk, but you look into it and it's kind of a vortex. And I thought, well, that was appropriate. You know, you know, when I get sucked into the vortex, but so I've, I've met quite a few of these people. And, and the point I make is that they're real people. We know who they are. I mean, it's not, you don't have to cook up a conspiracy theory. You know, it's, it's Mark Carney, uh, Mark Carney is an interesting guy. He he was the head of two central banks, actually three. He was the, the head of the Central Bank of Canada. He was the head of the Bank of England. And he was the chairman of the BIS. People are like, what's BIS? That's the Bank for International Settlements. That is the central banker's central bank. Based in Ball, Switzerland, and a, you know, kind of skyscraper on the river there. And central bankers from all over the world, but obviously the G7 are the main ones. They meet there once a month. There are no records. There's no minutes. Uh, if there are, they're not released. There's no accountability. There's no press conference. Uh, that really is secretive. Um, I, I actually knew one of the guys as the vice chairman of the Fed. We were business partners in a couple of different enterprises. And he was, he was the attendee for the U.S. Alan, this is Johnny Allen Greenspan days. Greenspan didn't like to travel that much. So he often skipped the monthly meetings, but, um, my friend, um, David Mullins went, he was the vice chairman of the Fed. He went, as the U.S. representative. So he was inside the room, told me a lot about it. So, yeah, so, but Carney was the chairman of that. So he's, he's, he's a trifecta is head of three different central banks, including the biggest and the most secretive. And, you know, guy there, Bob Rubin, he's, you know, everyone knows him from Goldman Sachs, Secretary of the Treasury, but he was, he's now, he's still around. He's the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, which a lot of people think is, uh, you know, as secretive as, as Davos. So, I could get on the list, but the point is we know who these people are. They're out there. They're giving speeches. You have to pay attention. But, uh, you know, the, the Davos crowd, the Bilderberg crowd, the BIS crowd, they're, they're known quantities. And I sort of steer away from conspiracy theories because you don't need them. I mean, that's not that conspiracies don't exist. They do. And, you know, you look for them. But I, I make the point that if you don't need a conspiracy, if you have like-minded individuals, in other words, if, if, if enough people, in powerful enough positions all have the same goals and they all agree on, you know, whatever it is they want to accomplish and how they want to do it. You don't need a conspiracy. They just wake up and do stuff and they're all in sync. What I always find it fascinating to look at where they went to school and what you discover is that they all went to like one of 10 places, you know, it's, um, you know, it's Harvard, Yale, university of Chicago, Stanford, um, maybe Columbia, maybe Wharton, um, in the United States or, you know, Oxford or Cambridge, uh, uh, Ecole Superior Polytechnique in, uh, in France. Uh, there are certain, there's, there's a short list of schools at Berkeley I would include. They all went to one of them. In many cases, they were each other's faculty advisors. Like when the younger one got the PhD, the thesis advisor was another one. And so they're, you know, they end up both on the same, you know, whether it's the Board of Governors or they're at Davos together or whatever it is. They all went to the same schools, same short list of schools. They taught each other. They all studied the same text and they all think the same thing. So if you can understand that, you can actually figure out what they're thinking, where they're coming from now. And the agenda is not that difficult either because um, they, they tell you now, here's where it gets a little tricky. And the IMF is a good example. The IMF is what I call transparently non-transparent. And what I mean by that is they can't say nothing. They can't say, we're the IMF, but we're not telling you what we do. They have to tell you what they're doing. And they do. There are hundreds of publications, academic papers, speeches, spring meeting, fall meeting, annual meeting, et cetera, et cetera. But they have a certain jargon. They have a certain way of speaking. They have words and phrases that are not the least bit intuitive or plain English, shall we say. So a lot of times in the work I do, I feel like an anthropologist who goes into the jungle, you know, studies the natives and comes back and and tells everybody else. Tells everybody else what's going on. Yeah. But what's, I guess what's unusual about me is you have a lot of insiders and they're the people we're talking about. And you have a lot of outsiders who like, you know, are throwing stones and criticizing and it's a conspiracy and all that, but they don't actually, and they're smart people. And I'm not, I'm not disparaging anybody, but 
they don't actually have the technical training that you need to understand what the insiders are doing and how they're doing it. And I'm unusual in the sense that I mean I have two law degrees and I before I got before I went to law school, I got a graduate uh degree in international economics, but especially in development economics. Uh where I went to school is the number one school, School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. It's uh it's part of Johns Hopkins University, but it's their Washington DC graduate school. I mean when you left there, it was like boot camp for one of three places. You either went to the IMF or you went to the intelligence community. Or you went to Wall Street. And I went to, I joined Citibank, which was, you know, the biggest bank in the world at the time. But you, you learned the, the buzzwords. I mean, I had this, I, you know, I, I was the last class to graduate before they completely abolished gold as a monetary asset. It was 71. Everyone says yes when Nixon went off the gold standard. It's not exactly what he did. He, he ended the convertibility of dollars for gold. But he, he right. intended to be yeah. temporary. He intended to be temporary. They were going to go back to it. They just never did. It wasn't until about 74 that the IMF just said, okay, that's it. You can be a member and not put up any gold. But that's when I was in graduate school. So we had to, we studied national accounts and uh, you had to understand gold as a form of money. Uh, it hasn't, if you know, if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you either went to mining college or you're self-taught because they, they completely stopped teaching at universities, but I, I cut the, the tail end of that. So that's, I, it's part of why I've always thought of gold as a monetary asset. But my point being, I speak their language, uh, so I can read their technical papers without a glossary and uh, understand what they're doing. So I think my insight into that whole crowd is probably, not probably, but definitely better than anyone who's not in the club. I mean, okay, Tim Geithner, by the way, he went to the same school I did. Tim Geithner went to the School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, so did Madeline Albright, you know, so did a lot of other people very involved in what we're talking about. So I'm I'm a little bit the outlier in the sense that I have that kind of intellectual training, speak the language, understand it, but I'm not one of the elites trying to, you know, take over the world. Yeah. So how do you go about like translating what you see, you know, say it's the Fed minutes or something, something basic. Like how do you translate that to to the way that readers can understand what is actually being said to them? Because it, it always seems like there's a, like, sort of a ghosting effort going on. Well, that's right. And, uh. Tell you one thing, but they mean an, another thing. Yeah. And in my, in my newsletters and in my books, people use the expression dumb it down. I like, go, oh, take it, take this complicated stuff and dumb it down. I never dumb it down, but I do convert it into plain English. There are very few technical terms or jargons or integral calculus uh, equations that you cannot put into plain English. In fact, if you can't do that, uh, you should stick to the faculty lounge and not, not try to kind of hold yourself out to the public. So uh, so that, that's exactly what I did. Let me just give you a concrete example. So prior to 2015, the Fed was, uh, they did the taper. So the, the first, ta- they're doing another taper now. We're in the middle of that. But from 2013, Bernanke started the taper. The taper was finished in late 2014. And then Janet Yellen took over and they were getting ready for the first interest rate increase. That was the so-called liftoff, which didn't happen until December 2015. A lot of people expected it sooner. I, I didn't, but everyone was waiting for that. Well, this, so the FN, FOMC was coming out with statements. They meet eight times a year, so not quite monthly, but you know, about every, every six weeks or so. And they had a code word, and the code word was patient. And they would say, we will be patient in deciding when to raise interest rates. So they were definitely telling you they were going to do it. And if you were in a carry trade, carry trade is when you, you know, you short dollars and uh, you borrow dollars, which means you short, you buy yen or something else and you invest at a higher yield and you capture the spread. And that trade works fine as long as two things are true. If interest rates go up, your your funding rate goes up, so you could very quickly go underwater. And if the dollar uh, goes down, you're going to have to pay back more dollars. So those are, the, those are the kind of two dangers. Well, when the Fed said, you know, we're we're going to raise rates, um, not saying when, they were warning you. If you were a big bank, if you were a hedge fund, if you were in the carry trade, they were saying, get out now or, or start to work your way out of it. Because if we raise rates and you're on the wrong side and you lose money, yeah, yeah, now we're in that phase, right? Where they're, they're telegraphing that they're going to raise what, four? 
Thomas, uh, thank you. Yeah, right. I mean, the markets uh, the markets are betting three for sure later this year, maybe four. There's some probability given to four. Yeah, and the the Fed is all about transparency. So what does that do? Uh, like uh, for regular investors, like most of the people that are going to be watching this, what does that do to like mortgage rates and that kind of thing? If they start trying to slow the um, whatever inflation is creeping its way in, there's some problems with supply chain and stuff like that that is related to COVID. But if they're talking about raising rates, that means that the entire economy is going to slow down. Well, that's that's what I that's my view in terms of what's going to happen. But but just getting back to the Fed, a couple of things you have to know about the Fed. Number one, they're always wrong. I mean, if you want a good forecasting tool, figure out what the Fed's going to do, and it's the opposite. That's a very, no, I'm, I'm serious. It's a very good forecasting tool. The other thing about the Fed, they're very, very transparent. They pride themselves on it. They want you to know what's going on because they don't want any shocks. They never want to do anything where the market didn't see it coming because that could really that could sink the stock market or cause an asset bubble. It could be in either direction, but the point is that they don't. Just think of the Fed as an institution that never wants to surprise anybody. By the way, that's a change. I was around in the 70s and 80s when they never told you what they were doing. That was part of the big deal about being a primary dealer. You got to talk to the Fed. You knew before anybody else in the market because they would kind of drop hints and, and then it would sort of filter out from there. But if you were on that inside group, that was extremely valuable. Today, it's the opposite. They never want to surprise anybody. And they don't change quickly. I mean, I love, I read all these things, you know, uh, some index inflation ran a little bit hot or uh, unemployment wasn't uh, as good as they thought. Everyone's, oh, the Fed's going to change course. No, they're not. They need to see three or four, even six months of bad data in a row before they say, huh, maybe we got it wrong. They don't do it on a month. They don't do it even on two months, three at the minimum and, and more like six. So when they tell you they're going to do something, believe them. But that's there, there's nothing that I do that's easier than forecasting the Fed. What do you think do, of their... Um their social agenda at the moment, like climate change or the pandemic or whatever. Like, where did that come from? Why are they doing that? Well, this gets back to what we were talking about earlier with the the Davos crowd and uh, Klaus Schwab and Mark Carney and uh, now Janet Yellen, who's Chris Secretary of Treasury, have signed up. There is a global climate change agenda. Now, here's the thing on climate change. Is, is, is there climate change? Of course there is. It has been for four billion years. There's never been a time when the climate wasn't changing. I lived for 10 years on Long Island Sound. It's a beautiful house is right on the water, a beautiful body of water. You can fish and uh, water ski and uh, wind sail and sail a boat and do all kinds of things. But it has a rocky coastline. And the reason it has a rocky coastline is that 12,000 years ago, it was a glacier. And glaciers move and they push the rocks out of the way. So when the glacier melts and becomes a body of water, you get a rocky shore. That's the difference between New Jersey and Long Island. The glaciers stopped at New York City, approximately. They never got to New Jersey, so I love Jersey beaches. But in New England, we have rocky coastlines because we were covering glaciers. So, okay, it was a glacier. Now you can sell your boat. That's climate change. But it took 10,000 years. And that's about the tempo. You know, it, 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 there can be ups and downs. You know, we had a... Uh, why did the Vikings get to Greenland in the 11th century? Well, the answer is it was yeah, a lot. I warmer. mean, there's whole cities buried under ice right now. Correct, uh, and there there are there were farms in Greenland. Now today it's a glacier, but in in the 11th century there were farms. It's not that the Vikings were more hardy and could deal with and live on glaciers. It was that the weather was warmer. I'm not I'm not not saying it wasn't tough to be a Viking. I'm just saying that there was a uh, this early Middle Age warming period, and then. Uh, you know, when I grew up, you have to read, uh, you know, stories like uh, Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates or whatever by Hans Christian Andersen. Well, I pictured everyone in Holland on ice skates going up and down the canals. Well, that actually was true in the 17th century because they had what's called the Little Ice Age in the uh, 17th and early 18th century. And I, it gets still freeze, I guess, but, but in those days, it was frozen solid every winter because, and, and the summers were not warm. Summers were not warm. So, you know, whether it's the, you know, the 11th century warming period or the 17th century cooling period or the ice age, now a lake or a sound or whatever, of course the climate changes. That's not the point. What we're looking at is not climate change, but climate alarmism, climate panic, climate fear. 
So then you always say, why? I, I, these things, once you identify them, you don't go, oh, I got that figured out there. You're trying to pull something off here. Well, what is it and why? Well, the answer is global control. So they want global governance, global taxation, and global regulation and world money. That's the agenda. So I just gave it to you. It's like, I, don't, I didn't break into a safe. I didn't steal it. I, it's obvious in what they're doing. Global governance, world money, and global regulation, global control. That's what they want. So how do you do that? Well, that's a solution. And that's, the, that's the end game. That's what they want. Well, if you want a solution, you need a problem because you're going to go solve the problem. So when you look at a lot... Can I just be like really dumb about this and say, why do they want that? Because I've been asking that question a lot of people like you, but also like people around me, like who don't even think about this stuff. Like what do they need control for? Like why? Well, I mean, it's it's part of human nature. I mean, you know, what was what Alexander the Great, uh, Napoleon, uh, Hitler, I mean... You go down the list, there's a long list of people who tried to take over the world. Genghis Khan, he actually came close. <laughs> he came closer than anybody else. So but isn't not- it weird that we agree, at least some people do, that we set up a system where you can't actually take control of the government. You can't take control of society. Like we believe that we got that far uh, in 1789. Why are we still doing this now? Well, what you're, what you're describing us, and you're right about 1789, but that's a very linear concept. And the world is not linear and history is not linear. As Buckminster Fuller said, there are no straight lines in the universe. And he's right. There are no straight lines in the universe, Euclid notwithstanding. So I think you have to go back to Aristotle, who described politics as a, as a cycle. It went from, you know, aristocracy to dictatorship to democracy, back to aristocracy. Uh, and Athens had a very radical form of democracy. I mean, when, when they were in their democratic period in the uh, mid to late uh, uh, 5th century uh, BC, it was, now they didn't have universal suffrage. It was men only and the slaves couldn't vote and women couldn't vote and foreigners couldn't vote. And, you know, it was a little, little tighter than we have today. But uh, but among the, the male adults who could vote, they would all show up in the Agora. Uh, and, and vote. And I think there's about 8,000 or 9,000 of them. And they did some crazy stuff. I mean, you know, the idea that if you lost a battle, you might want to punish the generals or in those days kill the generals. Okay. That's part of history, but they would have situations where they won the battle and they killed the generals because they didn't like the way they won. They like, hey, yeah, you won, but too many casualties. So we're going to kill you. And they did. And that was the problem with democracy. That, and by the way, that is not a constitutional republic which is what we have. Yeah, which is what we have. I which make is, that point on a regular basis. Yeah. Like when people bitch on TV that uh, we're trashing democracy. We don't have a democracy, and we never have. We're not supposed to. It was, it was not until the yeah. 1920s. It's a constitutional republic. Right. By the way, it was not until the 1920s when you had the direct, direct election of U.S. senators. From, yeah, 17, yeah. from 1789 to 1920, senators were either appointed by the governor were elected by the legislature of the state. And that was, they were your state. They weren't the people's representatives. They were the state's representatives. So the state of Massachusetts, the governor of Massachusetts would say, okay, you're my senator. Go down to Washington and look out for the state. And so that changed in the 1920s. But I mean, but that was a, that's a really good example of how the United States was never intended to be a pure democracy. And they, and, and the founding fathers read their Aristotle. They read John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. And, uh, Rousseau, but they also read Aristotle and Plato and, and Gibbons, you know, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And they knew, uh, again, from Aristotle and from, and from Rome that pure democracies always turn into mob rule. The reaction to mob rule is an aristocracy, but then the aristocracy becomes corrupt and becomes a dictatorship. And then they answer to dictatorship as a revolution, and you're back to mob rule. So it, it was it was a circle, not not a straight line. Yeah. Uh, so where do you see us right now, like in in society? I feel, I feel like there's a lot of mob components, but there's still some structure left that people respect. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is the greatest stress test for the Constitution since the Civil War. Now, certainly, I was around the '60s, and you know, there were anti-war protests and 
in the 70s, the weathermen were planting bombs on Capitol Hill. This Capitol Hill riot on January 6th wasn't the first of its kind. They used to put bombs in the Capitol, you know, and, and people were killed. But in terms of the Constitution, this is the greatest stress test since 1859, 1860, yeah. uh, and 1861. And it's exactly what you described, which is the Democrats and progressives and the Pelosi's and Bernie Sanders and AOC want to push towards something like the Athenian mob, something like direct democracy. So what does that mean? You know, pack the Supreme Court, uh, get rid of the Electoral College. Uh, let's bring in two new states so we can get four. Get rid of filibusters. Okay, exactly. Get rid of filibusters. Exactly. If you get rid of the filibuster, you basically turn the Senate into something like the House. You're going to have, it's like having two houses of representatives, you know, simple majority rule leader sets this, you know, no one doubts that's true in the House of Representatives and it's supposed to be. But the Senate is supposed to be different. If you get rid of the filibuster, you erase the difference. And then if you get rid of the Electoral College, um, then all of a sudden the president is just a straight up, straight up or down electoral yeah, vote. I mean, that's effectively what they did when they went to straight election of senators. Correct. They became residents of Washington as opposed to residents of their own states. Correct. And by the way, that, and though I said that happened in the 1920s and it did, that was the first progressive. It happened actually in 1913. Was it 1913? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I guess, yeah, 1920s, I'm thinking of, of the, yep. uh, uh, female suffrage uh, where women were allowed to vote. But right. Uh, so, but that period, the broad period, also 1890 to 1920, just to kind of bracket it. And what else did we get in that period? The income tax and the Federal Reserve. Uh, but uh, both. Uh, yeah, we and, called it in uh, Empire of Debt, we called it the revolution of 1913. Right. But the point is the progressive era we're living through now is the second progressive era. The first progressive era was the one we just discussed. Wilson. But Wilson was the highlight, but it started in the 1890s, you know, uh, William Jennings Bryant and, uh, you know, and all the things we mentioned. Uh, but, but the point is there is what I call, I call it the liberal ratchet, but progressive ratchet is just as good a word. And everyone knows a ratchet is a tool that turns this way, but never turns back. So you turn it and it locks. Now you don't have to turn it again. If you do, it'll lock again, but it never goes in reverse. So the progressives are extremely patient. They get what they can when they can. And then there's a backlash. What is it? All right. So let me ask you, because I think this is an important question. What is it that you think that they want that, like, I, I would call myself a libertarian with a small L. I don't, I'm, I don't vote. I don't believe in politics. I, frankly, abhor politics. But I also think that if you ignore them, then you ignore them at your peril. <laughs> right. Well, so, uh, what is it like? I, I've, I've read Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin. I've read what they wrote. I've read, I think, everything that Marx has ever written. And I don't get what do they want? They want to live at the expense of other people. Yeah, that's a little simplistic. I think, I think what they want, what progressives want in this country is a U.S. version of what we just talked about in terms of the global agenda. And they say, what do they want? Well, we just named all the things from the first progressive revolution. So it was the income tax, central bank, direct election of senators, uh, et cetera. So what do they want now? Get rid of the electoral college, uh, get rid of the filibuster, pack the Supreme Court, add two new states, four new senators, you know, et cetera, which will make it easier to pass whatever else is in the progressive agenda. We know what that is because they, I mean, they tell us, this is my point. You don't have to concoct a conspiracy. You don't have to be a mind reader. You just have to pay attention. They tell you what they want. And modern monetary theory is a big part of it. So it's, uh, you know, it's unlimited spending. They, they go, if you read, um, Stephanie Kelton, who's the big uh, guru on modern monetary theory, she says, you don't even need a government bond market. The idea there's too much debt, we got too many bonds, you know, we're we're not gonna be able to sell the bonds. She's like, Why do you need a bond market? Just give wire instructions to the Fed and tell them to send the money right to anybody you owe money to. So why why do you have to sell bonds to get money to deposit at the Fed or for the Fed to buy the bonds to give the money to the Treasury so you can pay pay your bills? Why do you need any of that? Just have the Fed wire the money directly to Lockheed or Raytheon or welfare checks or or anything else. And and the problem with that is um mm-hmm. Yeah. So the problem is that it obviates any kind of responsibility for the debt that you might owe. Well, like Professor Calvin would say, who cares? 
May, remember, Alexander Hamilton invented the government bond market. And the, the, the debate at the time, this is now 1789, 1790, early in the Washington administration, the United States owed debts from the Revolutionary War. We had just written IOUs, they issued Continentals, they, you know, that, that was the form of money, and they couldn't pay it back. And so the Congress said, well, that's easy, just default, screw them, you know, too bad. And Alexander Hamilton said, no. He said, borrow more money and pay back that debt and you'll establish your credit. And then when the new bonds come due, borrow some more and pay those and just keep rolling it over. And all these people who say, well, you'll never pay off the national debt. It's nonsense. You don't have to pay off the national debt. You do have to roll it over. And that's, that's the distinction. That's where, that's where the train wreck comes. You don't have to pay it off, but you do have to borrow more to pay off. It's like a Ponzi, in other words. Um, and Alexander Hamilton invented that. It's been going strong for 230 years. Where does it run off the rails? Well, it, again, paying back the national debt is not necessary, but rolling over the debt is necessary. And that has to do with confidence and trust. And if people lose trust in the value of a dollar or lose trust in the ability of the United States to be able to issue new bonds at, you know, rates lower than Zimbabwe, then, then it fails. That's when it fails. And that's, that's the Argentina problem. Uh, see, the, the problem with Argentina, and again, I, I've studied modern monetary theory because, you know, I always say if, you, if you're going to debate somebody, you have to know more about them than they do. Uh, so I, I've done a deep dive on it. And they say, well, the problem with Argentina is they print pesos, but they borrow dollars. And whenever you have to pay back the debt in a currency that you don't print, you can go bankrupt. But if you're paying back the debt in money you do print, you can never go bankrupt because you just keep paying it back. You just print more money to pay it back. But there are a couple of flaws in that. One is, uh, and this is where Kelton really falls down, she doesn't understand international economics. She's just looking at a closed yeah, like system. a closed system. A, right? a closed system, right. But she doesn't understand, well, yeah, but other things can happen. There are other ways to fail. One of them is uh, exchange rates. I mean, one of our newsletters, uh, Tactical uh, um, uh, currency uh, profits is is focused just on that, just on that, on exchange rates. And yeah, you can print dollars and pay back dollar debt, but if the dollar devalues eighty percent against other forms of money, and you have hyperinflation, and they start sweeping the dollars down the sewers, all of which has happened before and not not that long ago, you know, then all of a sudden it's non-sustainable. Nobody wants your debt. And by the way. This has happened. I mean, I just described it in the abstract, but in 1977, Jimmy Carter, when Jimmy Carter was president, the United States Treasury issued treasury bonds denominated in Swiss francs. They were called Carter bonds. It was U.S. Treasury. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was a kid at the time, but I remember. They were denominated in Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. And people go, well, the dollar would never devalue 90%. Well, actually, it did. If 1971, gold was $35 an ounce. In January 1980, gold was $800 an ounce. So if you value dollars by weight of gold, the value, the, the dollar devalued 90%. That's a 90% devaluation because it took 20 times as many dollars to buy the same ounce of gold. So that means your dollar has gone down in that example about 95%. So those kinds of extreme devaluations have happened. People just don't know how to measure them. And there was a repudiation of the dollar in 1977 because we issued bonds in Swiss francs. And, you know, we, we pulled out of it, but that's the point. Uh, if you know it can happen, if you know it's a risk, you don't want to push the envelope, whereas the modern monetary theorist and Stephanie Kelton in particular, Bernie Sanders, she's his main advisor. He's chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, among other things. They don't understand international economics. And so that's there. That's where the booby traps are in, in the exchange rate and devaluation. All right, let's move this on. Uh, I think we've probably beaten the dead horse so far. What do you think of cryptocurrencies and the idea of the Fed coin, which they've floated now? And I think they're in the period of um, accepting public comments on it. Like you have to like say the idea and then take in a couple months of uh, comments. Well, yeah, under the Administrative Procedures Act, if you have changes in regulations, and this applies in some fashion to the Federal Reserve, yeah, you have to put out a proposal and then you have a certain comment period. You can rush it, but generally 90 days. Uh, and then the comments come in, you have to have hearings, you have to consider the comments, you don't have to agree, 
But when you issue the final rule, you have to explain why you didn't, you know, adhere to certain kind So there's a whole process involved. But we're not at that stage yet. First of all, there's a lot of confusion between cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currencies. Okay. Uh, that's, that's kind of my question. C- like CBDCs. I was, I just want to say uh, CBGBs, but, uh, yeah, CBDC, central bank digital currencies are not cryptocurrencies. Or if you want to lump it all in, the, the greatest cryptocurrency in history is the US dollar because they haven't been, the last time the, the treasury issued a paper bond, like the kind your grandmother would have in her attic and clip the coupons, I think it was 1979. Uh, that, so the, the dollar has been digital ever since the message traffic is encrypted. So you can think of the dollar as a, a very successful cryptocurrency. But the difference is that the central bank digital currencies are the same currency in digital form. So it'll still be a dollar. It'll still be a euro. It'll still be a Chinese yuan. It'll still be a Japanese yen, but it will be in digital form only. By the way, you got to get rid of cash if you're going to do this because people will hoard the cash. So that there's a whole separate. Yeah, like they're hoarding coins right now, right? Correct. Yeah, well, the, the coins actually have some value by metallic weight. I mean, if you have a 1965 quarters, it was actually silver when I was a kid. A quarter was a quarter ounce of silver. Uh, and if you got one from the 60s, that's great, but they've been aluminum or zinc or something ever since. But yeah, that, that, that's a little different. But, um, so these central bank digital currencies are digital. They, the message traffic is encrypted. But they could disintermediate the entire banking system because one of the proposals is that you and I and everybody else in America or the world for that matter, we'd have an account at the Fed. You know, it would be Madison Wigan or Jim Rickard's account at the Fed. We'd have it on our iPhone. There'd be a little Fed coin app on the iPhone. And uh, if I wanted to send any money, I could just do it. It'd be kind of like Venmo or PayPal, something like that. But I wouldn't need a bank account, neither would you. No checks, no wire transfers, uh, no fees, MasterCard, Visa, all that. You know, I mean, MasterCard and Visa charge a two and a half percent merchant acquirer fee. When when a restaurant sells a lot of stuff, food for credit cards, they don't take those to the bank. They sell them to what's called a merchant acquirer. The merchant acquirer bundles a bunch of them, delivers them to say MasterCard. MasterCard pays them. And the MasterCard goes to the banks who issue MasterCards and collects all the money, and then they put it on your bill, and then you pay it. So that's like a five-step process with fees all along the way. Well, if you could have an account at the Fed, you could skip all of that. You could skip all of it, and it would just go from my account to your account at the Fed. So um, interesting implications for the banking system, but that's a, that's a story for another day. So that's the world of central bank digital currencies. And the Chinese have further said, the U.S. is, is working in a... Uh, it's in the R&D stage at MIT, probably a year or two away. If it gets to it, then yeah, they'll have the kind of process we, d- we described earlier. But the U.S. is still a couple of years away. But the Chinese are furthest along. They have a, uh, uh, they're past the pilot program. Uh, the Chinese are actually going to use the Winter Olympics starting in about uh, 10 days or so as a rollout of their central bank digital currency. If you go to the Olympics, no one's going. Yeah, the and they regulated uh, uh, blockchain too, right? They have banished blockchain, right. banished use, yeah. and, and Russia has. And actually, the United States announced today that they want to regulate crypto. So, so, if you, so if you talk about cryptos, if you're talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and Ripple, and all that jazz, uh, that's being squashed and regulated. Now the fans, the groupies, the Bitcoin groupies are going, you can never get us because we're in cyberspace, whatever. Fine. You know, good luck. You'll be, you'll be hunted down yeah, like criminals. Somebody yeah. just tried to buy a piece of land for me only in Bitcoin. And I was like, with the regulatory environment that's going on right now, yeah. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Yeah. You can do it. I mean, but you got to set up your own Bitcoin account and maybe you have one to. Turn it into something you can buy a cup of coffee with because you could buy land coffee. is land, uh, crypto is crypto. But uh, yeah, so the so the answer is look, those things are out there. They're coming. Uh, well, they're, they're here. The central bank digital currencies are coming. Um, there are other things underway. Um, I'm actually doing a lot of research on this at the moment. I'm working on a new book, and this will be uh, it's the first time I've written. I, I talk about it every now and then, but this will be the first time I've written kind of extensively on cryptocurrencies. So we've got some uh, views there, uh, some research that no one's ever seen before. Some think it may, may change the debate. Yeah, they're out there. And if you want some, knock yourself out. Yeah. All right. So give me uh, one piece of good advice for individual investor, somebody who's trying to manage their own money right now. Well, the key 
is diversification. Now that sounds incredibly obvious. Like, oh yeah, big deal, Jim. Everyone knows diversification. Uh, it might sound obvious, but it doesn't hurt. But well, <laughs> but it. Here, here's the non-obvious part. Diversification does work. You know, in theory, not just in theory and practice. Diversification does work, but most people don't know what diversification means. So I run into people all the time. They go, well, Jim, I'm fully diversified. I've got 50 different stocks in 10 different sectors. I've got technology, consumer non-durables, uh, you know, mining, uh, you know, et cetera. And I go, you're not diversified. You you're in have, stocks. <laughs> you may, you may have 50 stocks, but you have one asset class. It's yeah. called stocks. And they go up together and they go down together. Yeah, there's idiosyncrasies. And the, the thing is the, the non-correlation of stocks exists when you don't care. It's precisely when you care the most that they all go down together. The cor- you know, correlation gets to, gets close to one. So what's real diversification? Well, okay, have a slice of stocks. That's fine. Nothing. I'm not anti-stocks. Have a slice of cash. Have a slice of real estate. Have a slice of gold. Have a slice of, you know, alternatives, and that can be, you know, hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, art, fine art, whatever, uh, you know, land, farms, you know, et cetera. That's real diversification because some of those things will be slightly correlated. Oh, a bonds, if we have to mention treasury bonds, I like, you know, five year treasury notes, 10 year treasury notes. Some of those things are correlated, but not that much. And some of them are inversely correlated, meaning when one goes up, the other one goes down. And the one that kind of reduces the volatility of the portfolio is cash. And everyone hates cash because it doesn't have a big deal, but they underestimate the fact that it does reduce volatility and it creates enormous optionality. If you're the one with cash and things really fall apart, you can go shopping. You're the one who can go out and pick up all the bargains and no one's better yeah, you than one buffer. So I would counsel diversification. But my caveat would be you need real diversification, not faux diversification. Uh, so telling me you have 50 stocks, I, I kind of try and go, that's not diversified. All right. One last question, and then we can kind of end it until the next time. How's that sound? That sounds good. <laughs> the questions uh, are not a problem. Sometimes the answers are too long, but I, I can deal with the questions. No, no, no. I just, uh, I'm wondering, like, from your experience, because you, you've had – the experience that you have had in your life, what would be the worst thing that somebody could do right now? Well, it's kind of the inverse of the best thing. If the best thing is diversification, the worst thing is over concentration. So I, when I run into people, you know, I own some gold and they say, well, Jim, you have gold. How do you sleep at night? I'm like, you're hundred percent in stocks. How do you sleep at night? So when I see people like they're all in on Bitcoin or they're all in on stocks or they're all in on a, you know, a Vanguard Fidelity index, mutual fund, et cetera, or any asset class, uh, that's an accident waiting to happen. Thanks, Jim. During this chaotic economic and political environment, I highly recommend that you follow Jim Ricker's strategic intelligence. I hope you enjoyed this session. See you at the next jam. If you did enjoy this session, please let your friends know. Send them to 5-Minute Forecast Wigan Sessions.